Hey, what's up, guys? Alonso Football Talk here. It's finally here. The NFL Top 100 Players of 2020, as voted on by their peers, has been released by NFL Network, as they put it out every year. And I thought it was kind of interesting this year how they did it, putting the entire list out in a matter of four days, rather than how they did it in past years, for example, stretching this whole thing out to like 10 or 11 weeks even. But maybe they just wanted to have some things clear up first with NFL training camps, whatever it may be. Either way, a couple of the things that I don't like about the list, how it's being put together, the whole process behind it. NFL players actually only write down the top 20 players, which is kind of understandable since nobody wants to take that time and put together a whole top 100 list. But that also doesn't lead to the proper results as you have some guys that are biased on their rankings, putting teammates on. Next, as much as NFL players may be film junkies, they actually don't get to watch a lot of games that they are not involved in if those games don't include teams that they actually face or they're just limited to watching highlights because they actually have been playing themselves. And then finally, the voting concludes before the playoffs even starts, which can really be the only somewhat logical reason that Patrick Mahomes was only number four on the official list, even though that would still be wrong. But of course, they don't have the luxury as I do to do this during the off season and take a lot of time to actually put it together. But for the purpose of this list, I first put together my rankings of the top players at every single position, then kind of went off script by just writing down names in the order that they shot into my head before actually comparing this with my positional rankings, trying to weigh guys against each other, and ultimately ending up with this list. And just to make this clear, these rankings are based on players regardless of their position, since otherwise about half the starting quarterbacks in the league would be within the top 20 or so. And of course this is a bit of a projection and not solely built on what the players did the previous season, but also not about where they will be at the end of the 2020 season. It's about who do I want for this upcoming season, for the entirety of it. That has been kind of an issue in the past where players voted on other guys who didn't play the previous season. And then people talking about that they actually shouldn't be on the list. But then the NFL Network says it's for 2020 and it's kind of a big mess there. But overall, I really like the count and I love watching it every year. But the players get it wrong quite a bit and I just wanted to put out my personal list here to give you a look into my thoughts. So with that being said, let's get into some of the guys that didn't actually qualify. First off, Trent Williams, formerly of Washington, now has been traded to San Francisco. We just haven't been sure about his status for all of 2019 and we don't really know where he is at this point. Last offseason, when I put together my list, I had Williams just inside my top 50, right there with the Cowboys' Tyron Smith but both behind David Bakhtiari, so as that second or third tackle, however you want to look at it. But we still have to figure out, will he be the same player he was before then? Because he has incredible power and all-around athleticism for a guy his size, and now he'll be playing for Shanahan, the tackle-friendly offense in San Francisco. That should definitely help as well. Then you have Hunter Henry, tight end for the LA Chargers. He just hasn't been able to stay healthy. One of the most talented pass-catching tight ends we have in the game. In 41 career games, he's caught 191 passes, and 98 of them have actually gone for first downs, and he's averaging 8.9 yards per target, which is right there with his division rival Travis Kelsey. However, four years into the league, he has yet to play a full 16 games, and he missed all of 2018. In 12 weeks last season, he came up with 55 catches for 652 yards and 5 TDs. Then you have Brandon Brooks, obviously will miss all of 2020 with a torn Achilles, and it's a real bummer that he'll be out for the whole season since he's been fighting through several injuries throughout his career and he was really at the top of his game in 2019. Originally, I had him right there around the top 50 range before the news broke about his injury and he was my third highest ranked guard behind only Quentin Nelson and Zach Martin. A little preview for the list there. Brooks is a people mover in the run game and like a wall to run for in protection. So sucks for the Eagles that he's out. And then obviously all the players opting out for the 2020 season. Not really that I would have put any of them on the list, but you have names like Dante Hightower and Michael Pierce, they weren't too far off. Just heard about CJ Mosley as well. He would have at least been like an honorable mention for me. But yeah, as I'm saying that, let's turn to the 20 players that actually came up just short of making the list. Let's run for those names real quick. Adam Phelan and his quarterback Kirk Cousins, always on the fringe of being top 10 at their position. Phelan one of the better all-around receivers when it comes to route running and making those tough catches downfield. While well, Cousins was very efficient in the Kevin Stefanski, Gary Kubiak offense that took some pressure off him and won a big playoff game in New Orleans finally. Tyron Smith a couple years back with Trent Williams fighting for the title as the best offensive tackle in football but really took a step back last season I thought, just hasn't been able to stay healthy. Austin Eckler 
one of the most electric players in space last season. Really bailed Philip Rivers out quite a bit, catching those checkdowns, making big plays out of them. We'll have to prove that he can be a true workhorse in that offense. Cortland Sutton, one of the rising young receivers, have always been behind him. So physical, makes those big plays downfield, and is really tough to bring down after the catch. Kyle Murray, I'm almost certain, will make my list next year. Such a dynamic young player, immediately had to beat the guy for this offense, with a lot of pressure on him, and with more support around him, could make the next step in 2020. Austin Hooper, quietly one of the more productive tight ends in the league, in the third cutter, tight end happy offense in Atlanta. Let's see if he can carry it over to Cleveland. Demarcus Lawrence, always been great at setting the edge in the run game, and wins a lot of that cross chop, but didn't really show up for the Cowboys last season, I thought. Chris Harris Jr., one of the more versatile corners in the game, can play inside and out, will be interesting now with the Chargers. Will he play primarily in the outside with Desmond King in the slot, but has taken on the challenge of a lot of man coverage throughout his career. And then Brandon Graham, one of the more fun players to watch, always been undersized, never gotten quite the credit he deserves because the numbers weren't quite there. That has finally caught up a little bit, but tough against the run and a lot of versatility to move around the passing downs. Two tackles here, Taylor Luan and Laramie Tunsil, both very talented. Luan helped boost one of the top rushing attacks in the game in Tennessee and stayed clean for the most part in protection. Tunsil had a bit of a problem with holding calls last season, but immediately improved the left tackle spot for the Texans. One of the more athletic gifted tackles we have in the game. A.J. Bouye, also a little bit on decline now, but very quick feet. Fluid in his turns, can pull man and zone. Now with the Broncos as well. Theron Armstead, another very talented tackle. When he's healthy, he's one of the game's best, but hasn't played the full 16 games, I feel like, in his career ever. Mike Hyde, very versatile play on the back end. Can play deep, can drop into the slot, can blitz off the edge, do a lot of things for the Buffalo defense. Geno Atkins, now in the later stages of his career as well. That little bit of a drop-off might have something to do with the Bengals just having a horrific defense, but still a lot of quickness and power for the defensive tackle spot. One of the guys who will face twice again next year, Joel Petonio, big reason for the Browns' rushing success. Also has been responsible for one of the lowest sack numbers for the guard position. Kenny Galladay, another very underrated receiver, especially when it comes to his vertical prowess. The king of contested catches, a monster in the red zone actually led the league in receiving touchdowns. Rich Incognito, maybe not a name that the fans are very fond of, but he's an ass kicker in the run game for the Raiders, and when he came out of retirement, he immediately put his name back into the conversation among the top guards, incredible anchor as well in pass protection. And then Darius Slay had a bit of a down year in 2019, but has the speed to pretty much run with anybody, put up against the opposing team's number one receiver throughout games, and will pretty much do the same for the Eagles now. One of the big reasons that they've brought him in is that Amari Cooper has torched him basically for the last two years. A lot of rookies from last season were close here and I think will make the list next year, especially at the receiver position with DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, Terry McLaurin, but also guys like Miles Sanders, the running back for the Eagles, who I really expect to break out, Josh Allen, the edge rusher for the Jaguars, and the two Devins, linebackers Devin Bush and Devin White. At least two or three of these names should make the 2021 list. But with that being said, let's get into the actual list. I'm going to rework my way from the bottom to the top here. With the final spot, I have Matthew Stafford. The Lions just haven't been that relevant pretty much for his entire time there. And people love to bash on the quarterback. But to me, Stafford has been pretty much the only reason that this team hasn't been picking in the top 5 every single year. He's carried this team on his back for pretty much a decade now, which he literally broke last season. Stafford still has one of the most talented arms we have ever seen. He's one of the most cold-blooded passes late in games, and he looked like an MVP candidate early on last season, which was his second year in that system, where he actually wanted to run the ball and have a game plan, rather than just him going into shotgun, dropping back 40 times a game and being asked to make magic happen. With the next spot, Devin McCourty seems a little low for him, was a candidate for defensive player of the year over the first half of 2019, overall ended up with 5 interceptions, 7 passes broken up and 2 forced fumbles. One of the smartest players in the entire league, and a huge reason that the Patriots defense has been near the top for so many years, but he's about to turn 33 years of age, and there are some limitations now when it comes to his range and just pure athleticism. Another aging player here at 98, I have a lot lower than the players. I understand that the numbers for Richard Sherman were as good as pretty much anybody's on this side of Stephon Gilmore when it comes to cornerbacks, and don't get me wrong, Sherman was among the elite corners for at least half a decade, but he's now 32 years old and has lost some of that physical ability. He's still a great fit in that Seattle-based system, where his length and football IQ can really shine. 
but we also saw Sammy Watkins run right by him in the biggest moments of the Super Bowl. At number seven, a guy that if the NFL actually handed up a most improved player award like the NBA does, would have been near the top of the list. Darren Waller came into the league as an oversized wide receiver and in three seasons into the league, with one year away from the game, he had caught just 18 passes for 178 yards, but last season he finished second among tight ends behind only Travis Kelsey in catches with 90 of those and receiving yards with 1145. His 9.8 yards per target were also better than Kelsey or George Kittle. He may not be your typical hand in the dirt Y, but flexed out wide with his speed, he's a nightmare to cover. Then I have the Cowboys number one receiver, Amari Cooper, among the elite route runners we have in the game and has been one of the more productive pass catchers in the league since coming over to Dallas. These last two years combined, he's recorded 2200 yards and 15 touchdowns, converting about 73% of his receptions in the first downs. The reason I just don't have it any higher is that he didn't show up in the big games for them, or on the road pretty much in general for that matter, and he really struggled against the game's top press corners. Now a former teammate of his, Byron Jones, who since has signed the biggest contract for a corner with the Miami Dolphins. You look at the catch rate and yards allowed per target for Jones, they were still up there with some of the best, but he also allowed three touchdowns and has now intercepted just two passes in his entire career. He just got that monster deal from Miami because Brian Flores covets guys who can get into the face of receivers and tackle well. He just missed one of his attempts last season, so he will have plenty of chances to lock guys down. Just ahead of him, I have another young corner whose career development has been a little disappointing to me. After watching him as a rookie, I was ready to put Marshall Lydamo in the conversation for one of the top corners in the entire league. But in 2019, he was responsible for three touchdowns compared to only one pick and a passer rating of 90.9. Still, his feel for the position, the incredible loose hips to recover at the breakpoint, and the overall athleticism still have not believing in his future. At 93, Washington guard Brandon Scherf, now five years into the league, and outside of his rookie season, he's allowed just eight and a half sacks and been one of the most dominant run blockers we have in the game. He has had some issues with flags for holding, but he also helped pave the way for 34-year-old Adrian Peterson to rush for 900 yards, and overall Washington averaged 0.9 yards more in between the guards than towards the edges. And since we're talking about the big uglies, at 92, Rodney Hudson, the Eagles' Jason Kelsey will come up later, and to me he's the most complete center in the game right now, but Hudson has easily been the most effective pass protector at the position. In his five years with the Raiders, he has allowed just one combined sack and received the highest pass blocking grade by PFF in all five of them. Something he does in the run game that he really excels at is executing those short skip pulls or climbing to the second level of double teams to give his packs an open lane as well. And the final guy of this group, one of my favorites to watch in the entire league, Buda Baker, coming out of Washington a couple of years ago. He reminded me of a young Tyron Matthew. At 5'10", 190 pounds, he's a flying missile out there. I know that tackles aren't a very good statistic to evaluate players, and the bees in particular, but Baker led the entire league with 104 solo tackles and only missed 7% of his attempt, which is highly impressive. He doesn't have great ball production necessarily, but he can blitz off the edge and chase guys down from behind, knock guys out of their cleats over the middle, and he's just an eraser all over the field. One player that really sticks out to me was against Pittsburgh, where Deontay Johnson caught a screen pass and crossed the entire field, and he was looking to go in for an easy touchdown, and all of a sudden Baker shows up coming all the way across the field as well to make that tackle short of the goal line. All right, let's look at the next group. At number 90, Josh Jacobs, who was actually my pick for Offensive Rookie of the Year last season, and he didn't necessarily put his name among the elite backs in the game like uh, Saquon Barkley or Ezekiel Elliott did when they came in, but Jacobs almost quietly had a very impressive debut campaign. Despite missing three games and being on the field for just 45% of the snaps overall, he set a new rookie rushing record for the Raiders with 1150 yards, and when you look at all those metrics about individual contribution, somehow the rookie showed up all the time. He was number one in the league, and missed tackles forced with 69 of those, third in rushing yards over expectation at 0.81 yards, according to Nixon stats, and many others. 89, Mark Andrews, finished fifth among tight ends with 852 receiving yards and tied for second among all NFL players in touchdown catches with 10 of those. He was part of the greatest ground attack in NFL history with the Ravens, but when they threw the ball, he was Lamar's favorite target. Andrews is absolutely a threat down the seams, but a lot of his production came curling up over the middle against zone 
and he's a beast in the red zone where you can just put the ball on the top shelf and he'll come down with it. Next up, a guy that I've really loved ever since watching him beat up the bees at the Senior Bowl, Cooper Cup, coming out of Eastern Washington, wasn't looked at as one of the athletic standouts, but as a rookie, he already came close to 900 receiving yards in that explosive Rams offense, and after missing all of 2018, he was back even better last year. Cup led his team in receptions, yards, and touchdowns, with 94 catches for 1,161 yards and 10 TDs. He's faster than you think, he creates separation as a route runner, and he's one tough son of a gun. At 87, Harrison Smith, now on the wrong side of 30, but he's still one of the most complete players we have in the league. For most of his career in Minnesota, he was basically used as an edge set and run game as the boundary side safety, and you could rarely see him get taken advantage of by bigger buddies. Smith has also started to become more of a magnet for the ball these last three years, picking up 11 passes and breaking up another 29 over that stretch. One of the more underappreciated players in the game, Lamonte David, in eight years with Tampa Bay, has put together over a thousand tackles with 160 of them for loss, 22 and a half sacks, 21 fumbles forced, 11 interceptions, and 45 more passes defensed. And yet, he's made the Pro Bowl just once in his entire career, which tells you how meaningless it is as a measurement for a player. But for David, his instincts lead him to the ball carrier a lot of times before that guy can even make it past the line of scrimmage. And he's also tremendous all around in coverage, whether it's covering backs and Titans one on one or dropping the zone. That transition from the outside in the 4 3 to now an inside back in the Bucks defense was also incredibly smooth. A player that I was very surprised to not see make the list, Eric Armstead. There are people out there who say he was better than the Forrest Buckner and Nick Bosa. To me, those guys don't watch the game closely enough but Armstead is the guy with the most position versatility along that front, and he was actually the only one in that entire defense to record double-digit sacks. I was a little surprised to see the 49ers prioritize him over Defoe, but Armstead has certainly lived up to his first down status, and he's basically become what they hoped Solomon Thomas would be. At 84, Kenny Clark, and you look at the nose tackle position, it has become pretty devalued, and a lot of those two-down run stoppers that don't even have a job anymore, when you look at Clark, he's one of those guys who technically plays at that spot, but stays on the field in passing situations as well. Clark is an elite two-gapping run defender, but he can also disengage to make plays in the backfield with 17 tackles for loss. And his pass rushing skills have really caught up, recording 6 sacks in each of the last two seasons and 62 total pressures in 2019. And you didn't have to wait long for the second Viking safety. Anthony Harris was just tied for the lead league with 6 interceptions, and he broke up another 11 passes, really one of the most productive safety seasons we've seen, and that was despite missing a couple of games. Harris is so rangy, and he's allowed the Vikings to play Harrison Smith primarily down low. When teams targeted him last season, he was credited with a passer rating of only 44.2, and he's improved so much as a tackler, missing just 3 attempts in each of the last 2 years. At 82, another very underappreciated player, Melvin Ingram, Maybe not among the league leaders in sacks on an every year basis, with his career high at 10.5 having reached that mark twice, but he's one of the most versatile players we have in all of football. This guy can move around pretty much through the entire front seven, and he creates mismatches against pretty much anybody. Ingram is a fastball off the edge, but he also has a devastating spin to counter inside, and when he stands up and rushes against guards, his quickness is a nightmare. Go back to the 2018 19 playoffs. He had one of the greatest performances I've ever seen from a defensive player when he just wrecked the Baltimore Ravens offensive line. And the final guy among this group, Joe Mixon, he also made the cut from a list of the most underrated players at every single position late last season. As my pick for the running back position, Mixon has been lining up behind one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL, and he's still produced at a high level. He's so elusive with the ball in his hands, but at 220 pounds, he also features plenty of power to gain yards after contact, which made up 56.7% of his total in 2019. Overall, he has put together 2,888 yards and 17 TDs from scrimmage these last two years combined. Now let's look at numbers 80 to 71. First up, Deion Jones. Coming out of LSU five years ago, I personally thought he was too small to play on the inside full time, but he has proven me and many others wrong. Back in 2016, I thought he should have been named Defensive Rookie of the Year because he had a phenomenal debut campaign and has been the Falcons' best or second best defender pretty much ever since. One of the rangiest linebackers in the league, Jones' ability to avoid blocks in space makes up for a lack of bulk and he can cover so much ground in coverage. 
leading all linebackers with 41 total plays on the ball since entering the league. And just ahead of him, Jalen Smith, the term sideline to sideline linebacker, gets thrown around a lot, but one of those guys who can run down pretty much anybody on the field is Smith. People want to talk about how much better he was in 2018 with the duo of him and Leighton Van Der Esch. But statistically speaking, Smith was actually better, coming up with his first interception, reflecting 9 passes, and missing a low percentage of tackles. That entire Cowboys defense struggled last season, but he's the piece they want to build around for the future. At 87, Grady Jarrett, another one of those guys on the D-line who has been disruptive on a consistent basis and not really been given the credit he deserves. The numbers have already been pretty good for interior player. 17.5 sacks, 35 tackles for loss over the last 3 seasons. But the tape to me is even more impressive. The way he can knife through gaps and go backdoor against zone plays for example, has him flashing in the backfield routinely, and while he's always been an elite run defender, his pass rushing skills have really come along. Last season, he finished his pro football focuses number 3 ranked defensive tackle. And before we talk about the number 77 player on my list, is there anything more Ravens than trading a 5th round pick for a guy who has made the Pro Bowl in 5 of his last 6 years? At 34 years old once the season kicks off, Calais Campbell is certainly entering the later stages of his career, but he can still create major issues for blockers with the length and size he presents. Campbell immediately improves the ball to a pass rush, flexibility along that front to move around. And just ahead of him, I have Cam Hayward, who has been one of the more underappreciated defensive players in the NFL for some time now as well. Two years ago, I had him as a top 30 player on my list, and while I'm happy that the stats have finally caught up, 29 sacks and 37 tackles for loss since 2017, his play to me has dipped a little since then, and when you look at the Steelers, he was the third best player on that unit at best. However, Hayward is still one of the premier run stoppers and power rushers we have in the game. Making his debut at number 75, Fred Warner, a guy that I remember coming out of BYU, was right there as a top 10 prospect for me at the position, playing Sam linebacker almost like a big nickel for the Cougars. He's transitioned beautifully to Mike Backer. The way he can sniff up plays, that blazing speed to shut things down, and the way his playing space has translated to his NFL coverage ability, really making him a special young talent. I actually had some money on him as the Super Bowl MVP, I think with odds of 250 to 1, and I felt really good about it until Patrick Mahomes went crazy in the fourth quarter. I actually wouldn't be shocked if Warner was looked at as the top linebacker in all of football two years from now, or at least be in the conversation. And right ahead of him, I have the guy who to me is the most dangerous player when you throw against him in coverage, Marcus Peters. He came over to Baltimore mid-season and immediately delivered game-changing plays, had a pick six in just his first game with the Ravens, which would be one of three house calls on the season for him. That ability to anticipate and jump routes is something that opposing quarterbacks are really scared of, even though some of those gambles can also lead to unfortunate results for his team, which is why I don't have him even higher. At 73, Stefan Diggs, excellent all-around receiver, to me the best deep threat in the game last season. With 1130 receiving yards on 17.9 yards per catch, he made up for the third highest share of his team's air yards at 41.3%, behind only Cortland Sutton and Michael Thomas, whilst catching 87 passes less than Thomas. I can't wait to watch him catch bombs from Josh Allen in Buffalo, whose deep ball numbers will look a lot different with a receiver like that. Then there's the Mario Davis, was a first team all pro linebacker in 2019, thanks in large part to his great play against the pass, 21 pass breakups and 1 pick. Over his last 3 seasons with the Jets and Saints, he's put together 258 solo tackles with 35 of them for loss and 14 sacks. Davis has the speed to scrape over the top of blockers or shoot through the gap to arrive there in a hurry and he brings an attitude when he arrives there. He also only allowed 4.3 yards per target in coverage last season and missed only 5 tackles all year long. And to close out these 10 names, Dak Prescott, I feel like for the first time in his career, he was actually the driving force of this Cowboys offense rather than seeking that rushing attack. Prescott's had new personal marks with 4,902 passing yards, 30 touchdowns and 8.2 yards per attempt. But his team only went 8-8 eight and eight, and a lot of that had to do with Zeke not being quite the same and the defense struggling to stop the opposition or take the ball away. But Dak also came up small in some of the big games at New England versus Philadelphia to decide the division. And to me, I just don't think he will ever dissect defenses quite like a Brady or Breeze. Let's look at our next slide. 70-61. At number 70, probably the most controversial pick on my list here, Drew Breeze. I know this will get me a lot of hate, 
but whenever people want to give me the stats on Drew Brees, they forget to mention that he's playing behind an elite offensive line, throwing the ball to a record-setting receiver and one of the premier pass-catching backs, and he's working with one of the all-time great play calls in Sean Payton. I've often called Brees a well old machine in that system, and his command of the offense is impeccable, but the raw arm talent simply isn't quite there anymore. Haven't really seen them push the ball down the field for the last two years. And at 69, due to Smith Schuster, 2019 was definitely a good season for him. He missed four games and had less than half of the production of the year prior. But with that being said, a lot of that had to do with the worst quarterback situation in the league. And you don't put up over 2,300 yards and 14 touchdowns before you even turn 23 if you aren't a special talent. With Big Ben on the center in 2018, Juju finished top 5 in the NFL with 1,426 yards and he was named Team MVP over Antonio Brown, which the latter one let us know later on. Just ahead of Breeze, his division rival quarterback, Matt Ryan, to me has never gotten the love he deserves on this list or from people covering the league as a whole. And I still feel like people think about the 28-3 game and his MVP season to me definitely was more of an outlier due to playing with the game's best offensive mind in Kyle Shanahan. But when you look at Ryan, he's thrown for 4,000 plus yards in 9 straight seasons, completing exactly two-thirds of his passes pretty much, for a touchdown to interception ratio of 2.26 and a passer rating of 97 over that stretch. Matty Ice has pretty much always been second tier for me, but he's had to deal with some bad O-line play and a couple of questionable years of play calling under Steve Sarkeesian. At 67, Justin Simmons of the Broncos, and when you go through this list of mine, something that made me think about the players, they just seem to not respect safeties. For Simmons in particular, I've always been a big fan of him, and called for him getting more playing time after mostly being a backup in his rookie season when the Broncos last won the Super Bowl. His range, instincts, and smarts as a single high free safety have allowed him to become a true difference maker at the position, and he certainly had the stats to back it up last season, with 4 picks and 15 more plays on the ball. We're pretty much done with the first third of the list, and at 66 with Zach Ertz, you look at guys like George Gill and Kelsey, to me they're definitely in a tier of their own, but Ertz is still that third guy at the tight end position. For several years now, he's been one of the most productive pass catchers in the game. After setting a new tight end record for most receptions with 118 back in 2018, he took a little step backwards last year, but Ertz is still by far Carson Wentz's favorite target, having led the Eagles in both receptions and receiving yards in all four seasons that the quarterback has been there. But since he isn't as much of a downfield threat or a yards after catch guy as the two other guys at the position, as well as only being okay as a blocker, this is where I fall for me. Next up, a guy that the players seem to have forgotten about, Akeem Hicks. He did miss 11 games last season, recording only one sack and five tackles for loss when he was out there. So it's understandable why he would drop in the rankings. But let's not forget that in 2018, he rivaled Fletcher Cox and Chris Jones as the title for the league's best defensive tackle, not named Aaron Donald. In 2018, Hicks was a frequent wizard in the backfield, with top 10 marks in both quarterback pressures and defensive stops. And his impact was felt most when he wasn't on the field for the Bears last season, and they were closer to average than being number one which they were the year prior. At 64, a guy that felt really disrespected by the official list, Keenan Allen, I have him quite a bit higher here, but not ahead of the guys that he actually called out on Twitter. Really a master of his craft, so elusive off the line of scrimmage, one of the best route runners you have in the game, being deceptive with how he sets things up and has the quick twitch to create separation on the short and intermediate level. The reason he isn't even higher and ahead of the guys that he thinks that he should be ahead of lacks that vertical speed and doesn't really scare you after the catch. But if you need somebody to get open on third downs, this is your guy. He also terrorized Darius Slay in their matchup last season. And I almost feel bad about putting David Bakhtiari this low, but he's still one of the top 5 offensive tackles in the game for me, and I think what puts him last among that group is the fact that he's closer to average in terms of his run blocking than the other guys, but he has been one of the elite pass protectors in the game over the last 4 years at least, when he hasn't allowed more than 3 sacks once and the lowest amount of total pressures over that stretch for a tackle. Despite playing with Aaron Rodgers, who's finished in the top 6 in terms of time to throw in all but one of them. While he did allow 2 sacks for the first half of last season, from week 10 all the way through the NFC Championship game, Bakhtiari did not surrender a single sack. And another guy who finished lower than he has done in previous years now, Ezekiel Elliott. His name doesn't really come up to me in the conversation for the top backs in the game anymore, but he still finished 4th in the league with 1,357 rushing yards. However, 
that was running behind one of the top five offensive lines in the NFL. And to me, he just looked a step slow to what we've seen from him in the past without that explosion through the hole and turning good runs into actual big gains. With that being said, there's an argument to be made that he's still the most complete back in the game and he could return to glory in 2020. And at 61, Shaquille Barrett, I always thought that he was a good player as part of a rotation in Denver, but when he finally got a chance to shine as a starter, that's exactly what he did. After posting 14 combined sacks over his four seasons with the Broncos, he led the league with 19 and a half sacks in his first year of Tampa Bay. He also finished second in tackles for loss with 19 of those and for six fumbles. When you watch him rush the passer, his game is really built on the bull rush and long arm, those power moves, of which he can convert power to speed in terms of giving that little hesitation and faking the bull and then winning on a quick burst to the outside. Our final 10 names for today, at number 60, Aaron Jones had a real breakout season last year which I predicted before the season actually, you can go back to my analysis of that. He was on all my fantasy teams two years ago already and did pretty well, but I'd say he took another major step forward in 2019 and almost surprised me even. His 1,558 scrimmage yards were the eighth most in the entire league and he was tied for the most touchdowns at 19. That was despite touching the ball almost 60 times less than the backs ahead of him with 285 total touches. Jones is so explosive and he can just slither through defenses while also being a true threat as a downfield receiver from the running back position. Just ahead of him, Jadavian Clowney, and let's get this out of the way. When he's right, he can be an absolute game wrecker, but I really struggled with this ranking because Clowney is just such a disruptive player when on the field, which the stats simply don't tell you, but injuries have been too much of an issue for him. That's also a big reason why he's still not signed. With that being said, you cannot overlook how incredibly gifted Clowney is and how much better he's gotten using his hands. Go back to that week 10 game at San Francisco, that was the best performance from a defensive player all season long. And for 58, if you just base this list on last season, you could argue that Eric Kendricks was the best linebacker in all of football. He's been a beast against the run pretty much since coming into the league, but what really put him on a different level last season was his playing coverage. Kendricks only allowed 53.3% of the passes his way to be completed, which is actually a very low mark for a linebacker, and he broke up 12 passes, leading to a forced incompletion rate of 21.9%, which is more than 4% better than what Luke Kuechly did in his best season, who had been the previous record holder for that statistic. Our next offensive tackle off the board, Mitchell Schwartz, another guy who you could make a good argument is the best at his position right now, especially if you base it on that incredible postseason run he had, when he allowed no sacks and just one total pressure on 142 pass blocking snaps against some of the baddest dudes on the planet. Schwartz wasn't responsible for any sacks for the regular season either and the Chiefs averaged an NFL best 5.93 yards per carry running through the gaps to either side of him. A guy that Schwartz actually went up against last season, Daniel Hunter, another one of those guys who has really improved pretty much every year since coming into a league after being a pretty raw product coming out of LSU. The Vikings defensive end has put up 14 and a half sacks in each of the last two seasons, but he massively improved his total pressure number to 97 last season, including the playoffs. And he actually got the ball out of the quarterback's hands as well with three forced fumbles. Hunter's an athletic phenom who has learned how to string moves together incredibly well. Let's talk about another enormous snub from the actual list. Kevin Byard, to me, has become one of the premier safeties in the game over the last three seasons. He leads the league with 17 interceptions and broke up another 33 passes. The range he presents as a deep middle safety and the confidence he has in his game, combined with extremely dependable tackling space, missing just two of his 86 attempts last season, definitely should earn him a spot on this list. At 54, Joey Bosa actually comes in a few spots below his younger brother, just to give you a little preview. Nick is a little more athletically gifted, but Joey came into the league more technically refined in his hand usage even. Bosa may not quite have that burst off the line like a Daniel Hunter or that ability to bend like a Von Miller, but he's as complete a defensive end as we have in the game. He does a great job setting the edge on the run game, and when he gets after the passer, he's so smooth with his hand combos and can really find those weaknesses in the tackle's pass sets. My top left tackle in the league is Ronnie Stanley right now. He took his game to another level last season, when he was named first team all pro, on 515 pass blocking snaps, he did not allow a single snap 
and there were nine different games where he didn't surrender a single pressure. Stanley was also a huge piece to the Ravens breaking the NFL's all-time rushing record with 3,296 rushing yards, which had stood for over 40 years. And Stanley in particular had the lowest percentage of negatively graded run blocking snaps according to PFF. It will be a while until we see my top ranked linebacker, but to me Darius Leonard right now is number 2. Over his 2 years in the league, 28 games played, Leonard has put together 284 tackles, including leading the league as a rookie actually, intercepted 7 passes, forced 6 fumbles, recorded 12 sacks and deflected another 15 passes. Nicknamed the Maniac, he shows up all over the field and truly has a knack for the ball. And the final guy we're going to talk about today, number 51, Jason Kelsey. To me, the title for best center in the league has been in Philadelphia for at least three years now. Kelsey may not be quite as powerful as a few other guys, but the mobility to beat linebackers to the spot and the way he can put hands on people as a puller or on screen plays in space really allows the Eagles to do pretty much anything. Kelsey also does a great job of recovering in pass sets and transitioning assignments against twists and other games being played up front by the D-line. Since 2015, he's allowed multiple sacks just once. And that'll do it for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, share it with at least one friend today. You can check out some of my other videos here on this YouTube channel or on my page hellosofootballtalk.com. I will be back next week with numbers 50 all the way to the top player in the NFL. So please wait until then before you tell me who you think got snubbed. But always feel free to comment. Let me know about some of the guys that you think were underrated. Some of the guys I might be too high on. And I'll try to respond. So until then, see you later. Peace.